Hello, I am Amy Wilde. Today I'd like to talk about the tiger snake. Myths and misconceptions absolutely swirl around these creatures throughout the southern part of Australia where they live. Today I'm going to use footage from three different tiger snake relocations, just so I don't have to spend too long harassing any one individual. Snake welfare first! So here's contestant number one, this is Susie. She likes walks on the beach and running away. And number two, golden banded young Gregory is a chilled out dude who mostly likes eating frogs and sleeping in small dark places. And speaking of dark, contestant number three, Darlene, has a sense of humour as dark as her dorsal coloration. Anyway, so yes, this is the tiger snake. Notechus cutatus occidentalis. But yeah, I just want to show you a bit of snake behaviour today. Get you understanding these gorgeous, though, yes, highly venomous snakes. Yeah, this is just a little baby. It's going to get quite a bit bigger. It's probably between a metre and a metre and a half in length. Although there are records of some tiger snakes getting up to two metres in length, which is an absolute monster of a tiger snake. That's not very common. Very variable snake. Here in the southwest of WA, they're usually black or dark brown. It's always yellow on the belly here and often with beautiful yellow bands like this one, hence the name the tiger snake. But throughout other parts of southern Australia and Tasmania, they get even broader range of colorations. There's a few different subspecies scattered around and some even suggest that there might be a couple of different species within this network of snakes that we call the tiger snake. To break that down into a bit more detail, one source of variability among these snakes are their island populations. There's actually one school of thinking that suggests tiger snakes are divided into two full species, the second being labelled Notechus ater or the black tiger snake, mostly occupying offshore islands. These snakes do have a lot of physical differences, most notably their far larger size. However, they have since been shown to be genetically very similar to their mainland and Tasmanian counterparts, which makes sense as these little islands realistically haven't been islands for that long. These island-bound snakes have simply evolved very rapidly to become much bigger in order to predate on baby birds, what with their regular smaller prey not being available, and blacker, probably in order to heat up faster so as to digest said larger prey. It's actually a well-known phenomenon in biology. Animals restricted to islands tend to become either giants or dwarfs very rapidly, usually in response to changing menu items, but this does not lead to significant genetic change. However, there is good reason to believe that since the western population of tigers, like this fellow, have been isolated for so long from their eastern counterparts by a vast stretch of desert, they are absolutely candidates for being a truly separate species, that is, genetically very different from the myriad subspecies of southern and eastern Australia. As renowned author and herpetologist Steve Wilson pointed out to me, there are several other reptiles with sister species on the east and west, but very few, if any, with separation as significant as that of the tiger that are still considered one species. Therefore, it seems pretty clear that more genetic testing needs to be done between the eastern and western populations to determine once and for all just how unique this western tiger snake is from all the rest. One thing that personally irritates me is that on a lot of the snake shows you see, the presenter is yelling out and going whoa and their arms are out and they're doing all these big movements and they're talking about how dangerous this snake is and the snake's arcing up and it's hissing and it's striking and you're thinking to yourself wow what a terrifying beast you know this thing just wants to fight it just wants to bite you but <laughs> the thing is, is the reality is this is a poor trapped animal that's not being given the option to run away and then is being stressed out on top of that so it's being trapped and threatened now you take a rat, a horse, a bull, any animal in the world, you trap it and you threaten it, what's it gonna do? Take a human, it's gonna have the same thing. It's gonna think its only possible option to survive is to attack. As soon as you calm down, calm down your movements. I don't have to talk quietly because they can't hear my voice, unless I speak really, really low. 
Okay, I was actually wrong. So I already knew that snakes, despite having no ear holes or eardrums, can hear some airborne sound via a combination of their inner ear comprised of a single ear bone attached directly to one of their jaw bones and auditory hairs, plus something called somatic hearing or sensing the vibration of airborne sound as well as ground and water vibrations through their whole body, especially their head and lungs. What I didn't realise until doing some more recent reading is that they can hear a wider range of sound than I thought, not just very low ones. It's still not much compared to us, mammals have evolved our intricate hearing system much further than reptiles, but snakes can hear optimally between 80 to 600 hertz, which is equivalent to the middle C on a piano, plus about one octave above and two below. And yep, my speech right now is smack bang in the middle of that range. So my bad, Susie could hear me all along. But hey, anyone with a good curious mind has got to be happy to prove themselves wrong once in a while, I reckon. Anyway, where was I? Oh right, defensive behaviour. Tiger snakes are definitely one of the least subtle of Australia's snakes when it comes to communication. They're quick to flatten out their necks just like a cobra when threatened. See that? They make sure that wide neck is angled toward their attacker to look as big as possible. Tiger snakes are also renowned for their defensive attitudes. Locally, stories abound of them actually chasing people. Now, this is an area of fiery debate worldwide. Do snakes chase people? For myself, of the countless tiger snakes I've come across in the wild, every single one has run away. Or at least tried to before I've caught it. But having said that, tiger snakes are a bit slower than your average Aussie venomous snake. So if they feel cornered, or like you're standing between them and their best chance of escape, which bear in mind might be a tiny dark hole you have no idea exists, they're more likely to do a little lunge at you to give them space to get away, than to simply run for the hills like our swifter snakes. But that does not mean they're going to actually chase you over any any amount of distance or that they're trying to bite you, let alone envenomate you. Anyway, a couple of other highly knowledgeable venomous snake specialists have already done great videos on this topic, so do check their links in the description. This is a real classic defensive Aussie reptile here. I've seen this basic body language across many species. Puffing up, refusing to blatantly run away because they're too likely to get caught, moving parallel to their aggressor, keeping an eye on me, but really heading to the very nearest bolt hole they can find. Bye buddy! Well guys, that's all I've got for today. This guy's definitely done his bit for the snake community. Got some beautiful water behind me, I'm sure it's full of frogs. Gonna be this guy's dinner. Thank you for watching, stay wild, and I'll see you next time. What is over there? Oh, that's it. Bye bye buddy.